listening to the Lutheran Ladies Lounge podcast. I'm Sarah. I'm Erin. I'm Bree. And I'm Rachel. Today is a story time with Sarah Day, which Woo! is always fun for me. I love telling you stories. Uh, today, I'm taking this in a little different direction than usual. Most times, it's a story of a maybe not so famous Lutheran women, but today it's going to be a slightly different for two reasons. First of all, January is when we traditionally celebrate life because of the anniversary of Roe v. Wade every year. And so we have the March for Life to march for the the voices of the unborn. And so that's usually happening right around this time in January. The other reason is that Holocaust Remembrance Day is on January 27th every year. So this is celebrated every year on January 27th because January 27th, 1945 is when Auschwitz-Birkenau, the largest Nazi concentration and death camp, was liberated by the Red Army. So... Because of those two things, I'm going to tell you the story of a heroic woman who stood for life in the midst of the Holocaust, and her name is Stanisława Leszczynska. So this is a caveat, ladies out there. The story does happen during the Holocaust. It is kind of gruesome because it's the Holocaust. So viewer, listener discretion is advised. If you have littles that listen, you may want to listen to this first and determine whether or not this is an appropriate story to listen to or to just relay to your kids about this wonderful woman that I get to tell you about. I also strongly urge you, because uh, this is the time of Holocaust Remembrance Day, to find stories around you of the Holocaust. I love listening to stories of survivors and stories of the people who had to go through this time, who helped other people at great risk to their own lives. These stories are amazing, and you can find them. There's plenty of books about them. If you have a local Holocaust museum, I highly recommend that you visit it however you can right now. I know not everything is open. St. Louis has an amazing Holocaust museum that will be reopening I believe this uh, next year, I believe it's 2022. They're under renovation right now. Mm -hmm. Wonderful Holocaust Museum, lots of resources, and they have a a lot of stuff online too. So I'll put that link in the show notes so you guys can look through all of those online resources that they have too. You can learn so much. They have a whole like audio library of stories. It's it's really great to look at the pictures and, and read the stories that they have too. So I just want to share a couple of history details. I promise not to get too bogged down. You know, I'm a history lover, and this is like my favorite (laughs) time period of all to study. So (laughs) when I was writing this, I was trying not to tangent too much because it's really, really easy to do with World War II history because you just find all of these rabbit holes to go down. But a couple of of historical things that I do want to put in here just because they're kind of relevant. We often hear of concentration camps during World War II. This term is the generic term applied by the Nazis to all of the camps, death camps, slave labor camps, internment camps, transit camps, punishment camps. Since this story involves Auschwitz-Birkenau, which was a death camp, those camps were Nazi camps for the mass killing of Jews and others like gypsies, Russian prisoners of war, and ill prisoners. All six of the death camps were located in occupied Poland, which I don't think was something that I realized until Mm. writing this. I think I'm still like learning all of the depth of all of what happened actually in occupied Poland as opposed to uh, elsewhere during World War II. The the Germans wanted, the Nazis wanted to have these camps, but didn't want them in their own backyard. That's really telling. Of course not. Of course (laughs) not. Yeah. Well, and, and I mean, the Polish Jews were just brutally, brutally just massacred during this time. So We also often talk about the Holocaust um, or quote unquote, the final solution, which is just horrible. I, that term like makes my skin crawl, but that was the Nazis term for it as the murder of 6 million Jews at the hands of the Nazis. These concentration camps also housed innumerable numbers of gypsies, resistance fighters from all nations, German opponents of Nazism, homosexuals, Jehovah's Witnesses, the physically and mentally handicapped, habitual criminals, and the antisocial people like beggars and vagrants. So they it wasn't these these camps didn't just house Jews, it was it was this huge number of people that the Nazis just didn't want out in society, which doesn't make it better, it makes it probably worse. Yeah, um, pretty cleansing. Exactly. Yes, which is just terrible it makes me so mad i'm not even gonna sugarcoat that 
Yeah, I'm researching. I, me. It just mm-hmm. angers me. Which yeah. I think is a good thing. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> it, it is worth remembering, though, that not all Germans were Nazis. You know, yes. that we really need to be careful about painting with this broad brush. And not all Nazis were aware of or involved with the atrocities that were happening throughout the war. That, you know, I, I am a huge fan of the film Jojo Rabbit. And mm-hmm. I love that movie, but it really does a good job of painting the difference between the people who just got swept up in the movement versus the people who were the die hard, hardcore believers and practitioners of this philosophy. And yeah, it's, it's a cautionary note for ourselves that you can be complicit in something that even you're not fully aware of and don't really want to be fully aware of. Because, of course, we never, ever, ever want that to happen again. Not on our watch. Right. Which is part of the reason why I like to tell these stories and to bring these people up and to talk about this part of history, because we all need to know more of of what actually happened during this time. And also hear the stories of people who fought against such great evil at at expense to their own selves and their own families. These heroes are are pretty great. And along your your point, Rachel, I just read The Nightingale a few months ago, and and it's the same thing of painting a picture of of there is this this difference between people who who did get caught up in it and other people who were just evil, evil, evil to the core. So. Mm -hmm. This is one of those stories of, of incredible courage and hope and faith in the midst of unthinkable evil and horror. And I'm also going to apologize in advance to our Polish speaking sisters in the lounge. Polish is not one of the languages that I have learned <laughs> how to pronounce. And in researching this episode, I now know even more deeply how much I don't know how to say things in Polish. So I'm going to do my best and hopefully not trip over these things too much. So Stanisława Zabritsky was born on May 8th. She shares my birthday month. I love that. 1896 in Łódź, which is spelled L-O-D-Z, Łódź in central Poland to a Catholic family. She was the oldest of three children with two younger brothers. Her parents worked hard so she would be able to go to school. Her father, Jan, was a carpenter, but he was drafted into the Imperial Army and sent away. So her mother, Henrika, worked in a factory so Stanisława could attend private school. I find this part really interesting. In 1908, they moved to Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, for better economic opportunity, but returned to Poland two years later. It's so interesting. My family did that. They didn't come back, but... Going to Rio. A lot, of, a lot of families did. I imagine there was a bit of a culture shock. Poland to Rio is quite the change. Yeah, that's a very different culture. <laughs> Stanislava graduated high school in 1914, just as World War I was erupting. Two years later, on October 17th, 1916, Stanislava married printer Bronisław Leszczynski. She was 20 years old. In 1917, she gave birth to her first child, a son, Bronislaw. In 1919, a daughter, Sylvia, came along. The next year, in 1920, they relocated to Warsaw. And then, so while in Warsaw, Stanislaw enrolled in the Midwife College and graduated with honors in 1922. And she loves this position as midwife. Like, this is her calling in life. Also in 1922, she and Branislav welcomed their third child and second son, Stanislav. The next year, in 1923, her fourth child and their third son, Henrik, was born. So they have four babies. And how old is she at this point? She would be... 27. So she's a young... Like, by any definition in my book, any like, she's a young mom to have that many kids by 27. And they had them fairly quickly, yeah. Which, yeah. I mean, at that time... How many I don't know. Did she four. have yeah. four in six years? Seven? Yeah, that's. I mean, it seems strange now, yeah. but um, I mean, think about people it. People don't even get married till they're twenty-seven now. A good Polish yeah. Catholic family, they're yeah going to be yeah. having babies. I mean, I had four kids in my first eleven years of marriage, so I'm behind the eight ball. <laughs> <laughs> oh my! I guess is the lesson I'm learning today. <laughs> <laughs> That's not the lesson today, Brie. You don't have to go popping out babies yet. <laughs> <More lessons>. Okay. <laughs> not the takeaway. So <laughs> sorry. <laughs> 
So fast forward to 1939. During this time, I mean, they were they were living a pretty normal life. You know, she loves her job as a midwife. They're, I would assume, fairly happily married, raising their babies in a what post post World War One, pre World War Two Poland, pretty usual life. And then things changed in 1939. So Germans invaded Poland on September 1st, 1939, and life immediately gets worse for Stanisława and her family. So Loch, nope, Łódź, has the second highest population of Jews in Poland, and her neighborhood in the city became part of the ghetto in Łódź. So a ghetto, maybe you guys know this, maybe you don't. A ghetto was the Nazi term for the part of the city where Jews from surrounding areas were forced to live. Most ghettos were in Eastern Europe, and they were usually full of overcrowding, starvation, and forced labor, generally forced labor for the Nazis, which is just terrible. They were eventually all destroyed when Jews were deported to death camps. So Stanisława and her family were forced to move out of their home and to a different part of the city. They also had to face the ugly truth of what was happening around them and how they were going to respond as a family. Would they stand by and just let the stuff happen or were they going to actually do something about it? They decided to do something about it. Mm. So they hated the conditions that the Jews in the Wuch ghetto were living in. So they made the decision to help them. The whole family, including their four kids, joined the Polish resistance. I love reading stories about underground (laughs) resistance, like one of my favorite things to read about. Anyway, and started smuggling food and false documents to the Jews, which obviously things that were very strictly forbidden. So at this point, things get a little worse. The Leszczynskis were caught in their smuggling act in 1943, which That's four years after the war started. They lasted a while. It's possible that they lasted a while doing this, which is really cool. Stanisława and her youngest three children, Sylvia, Stanisław, and Henrik, were arrested and brought to the Gestapo on February 18th, 1943. Her husband and oldest son managed to escape, and they fled the city. Her two younger boys were taken from her and sent to work as slave laborers in the stone quarries of Mauthaus and Gusen concentration camp. Her husband kept fighting the Germans, but he was killed in the Warsaw Uprising of 1944, which was a major operation in the summer of 1944 by the Polish underground resistance. So Stanisława never saw her husband again after she was arrested, which is really sad. Yeah. Stanisława and Sylvia, who was a medical student at the time, were sent to Auschwitz on April 17th, 1943. So they, that was a month after they were arrested. And I, when I was writing this, I couldn't find anything. But now that I've read a bunch of novels from this time, my, my mind keeps thinking about what they had to endure during that month of probably questioning by the Gestapo. Like that, oh, brutal stuff. They were tattooed with numbers 41335 and 41336. When they were brought in, an SS guard had thrown Stanislava's midwife papers to the ground when she was standing there saying that she wouldn't need them. But when he wasn't looking, she picked them up and hid them in her uniform. Her first (laughs) act of sticking it to the man. (laughs) Right. And she did not stop. (laughs) So she actually found a German doctor and told him she was a midwife, which is something like the second thing that could have gotten her killed, probably should have gotten her killed because you didn't address a German soldier in a concentration camp without permission, like ever. That was not a thing that you did if you were a prisoner. But they spared her. She was assigned to work in the infirmary in what they called the quote unquote maternity ward, which is not the kind of maternity ward that we would find in any American hospital or any hospital probably anywhere in the world today. And her daughter was able to come work along with her because she was a medical student as well. The maternity ward, quote unquote, was a dark and horrid place. Mm. It wasn't one of those places of joy, of new life. It was a place to probably usher in the death of your child and maybe even yourself. Stanislava worked in three infirmary blocks and they were all infested by rats and vermin. So this is just a little, this is actually a description from Stanislava herself. She gave a report about her time in Auschwitz. And a lot of this comes from that report. And I did leave out some of the really terrible stuff that you can go read on your own if you want to read more about this. 
So they these blocks were built low on low lying land, so they would flood when it rained, and they would get just inches and inches of water in them. The stacked bunks, three stacked high, were bare wood and straw, and they were filled with filth and bugs. It was overcrowded with four women to a bunk and dirty. There was a brick stove that ran lengthwise through the barrack, and a fireplace was on either end, but it was rarely used to actually heat the building. Those fireplaces were actually where women would give birth because there was no other place in the infirmary that would suit a woman who was in labor. The rats were as big as cats, which is terrifying, and would attack the sick women. So Stanislava and other women who were healing would keep watch at night and literally fight off the rats so that they wouldn't attack these women who were healing. Worms were everywhere. Typhus was everywhere because of all the lice. And at that time, when someone was discovered with typhus, they were generally just sent to the gas chambers because the Nazis didn't want to have to deal with a typhus outbreak, even though probably most people had typhus because it was just everywhere. Dysentery was rampant, which is, a, I mean, their food was disgusting. So, of course, nobody's bodies were working properly. There were 1,000 to 1,200 patients in the block, and 10 to 20 of them died every day. There were no medical supplies, just a few tablets of aspirin to give out every day. No bandages, no medications, no baby swaddling, no diapers. So most pregnant women didn't even survive to get to the maternity ward. The Nazis didn't want pregnant women in these camps, essentially. Most were sent immediately to the gas chamber after arriving at camp. Others who found out they were pregnant after arriving at camp would often seek out abortions so they wouldn't be discovered because they would just be sent to the gas chamber. And many women who found out they were pregnant would be executed eventually. Others who were quote unquote lucky enough to survive were sent to the infirmary to wait out their pregnancies in these really horrible conditions. So two German quote unquote sisters, Schwester Clara and Schwester Fanny, watched over the women in these wards. And this part is really sad, so fair warning. Sister Clara was a midwife by trade, but she was actually sent to Auschwitz for infanticide, which is a little mind-boggling that she was watching over pregnant women, but she was sent there because she was killing babies. So instead of assisting with the births, which I guess would have been illegal even for the Nazis, she was in charge of murdering the babies after they were born. So in the maternity ward, the babies would be taken from their mothers and Sister Clara and Sister Fanny would take them to another room and drown them. And that's what happened to these babies. Oh! Up until May 1943, all the babies born at Auschwitz were murdered this way, which makes me want to punch walls. Makes me want to throw up. That too. Makes me to come again, like now. Amen. Also that. (laughs) So the good thing is that Stanislava would not have any part of this. When she learned that she would be helping Sister Clara and Sister Pani in this, and they ordered her not to cut umbilical cords and just place babies with their placentas in a bin to be drowned, she was like, nope, not doing it. Who knows why the Germans didn't kill her then? Because (laughs) they probably should have. She was literally directly disobeying an order. (laughs) And this wasn't the first time that she was just like, no, I'm not going to do what you told me to do because I'm a religious person. I believe in human lives. I'm also a doctor. I don't take people's lives. I don't hurt people deliberately. So I'm not going to do this because you don't do this to human people. And that's what she did. So she set about to care for these women and babies as best as she could, even in the horrendous conditions, knowing that A lot of them would probably still eventually die. It didn't matter to her. She cared for them anyway. She had no running water, no blankets, no diapers, next to no food. Pregnant women who knew that their labor was coming would actually start trading in their bread ration for a few weeks before they would go into labor so that they had enough to trade for a sheet so that they could cut the sheet and make their own swaddling and diapers for the babies. And there was no running water, but they still had to wash them. And they ended up like drying them on their backs and their legs because you couldn't hang anything up in the barrack to dry because that wasn't allowed either. Up until May 1943, conditions were really like the worst of the worst of the worst. And in May 1943, that changed a little bit. The blue-eyed blonde babies 
were taken away and given to German families to raise as Aryans. Stanislava devised a way to tattoo these babies with secret markings that the SS wouldn't see so that mothers after the war would have some hope of finding their kids, which was such an act of mercy for her to do that for these mothers and to figure out a way to do it without the SS knowing. Yeah. Which is really amazing. Jewish children continued to be drowned after they were born. They were tattooed with their mother's prison number, which just seems like an extra uh, horrible thing to do. There was no saving these babies uh, because they were under constant watch and nothing would escape the, the the sisters that were watching. The remaining children starved to death because of lack of food and their mother's lack of milk from starvation. Right. Stanislava delivered over 3,000 babies when she was at Auschwitz, which is a mind-boggling yeah. number She, because she wasn't there for two years. She mm-hmm. was there for two years. She worked tirelessly for these women to care for them so that no matter what happened to them, they knew that somebody was there, somebody loved them, somebody was caring for them. According to Stanislava, during her time at Auschwitz, Sister Clara and Sister Fanny drowned over 1,500 babies. Another 1,000 died of cold and hunger. 30 survived until the liberation of Auschwitz on January 27th, 1945. There are some other reports that say that 60 survived, but at least 30 did. And I would have to say that a lot of that had to do with her care and concern for these mothers and their children. And this is... The best part of this whole story, so you know she's a deeply religious person, every one of these babies she baptized when yes. she birthed them. Mm-hmm. That made me cry when I was reading. Mm-hmm. <sighs> she cared so much about these children and about her faith and about these families. She stood up to the Germans several times. I've already told you a couple when she refused to go along with their brutal tactics. So she actually met Nazi camp Dr. Joseph Mengele, who maybe you've read about him and his absolutely evil acts. Uh. Evilest of the evil of, of Nazi men. And he was like hopping mad when he heard what Stanislava was doing. Again, I don't know why he didn't send her to the gas chamber because he had every right to in their Nazi land of weird and evil rules. He screamed at her that an order is an order, but she still refused. Mengele was known as the angel of death at Auschwitz. He was the one that performed deadly experiments on prisoners, and he was one of the officers who selected the victims for the gas chamber. Okay, so Mengele may have been the angel of death, but Stanislava had a bunch of angels on her side. A little bit more powerful, I would say. (laughs) Exactly. I mean, you just see the hand of God. In her story, Mm -hmm. um, giving her the protection she needed to do the heartbreaking work that was put in front of her. Yes. One of the doctors asked her for a report on postpartum infections and mortality rate for mothers and newborns. And you would think, being in a Nazi death camp, that those numbers would be sky high. But they weren't. She had zero deaths. Nobody died during birth or right after birth. By natural causes. That is amazing. That is amazing. I mean, postpartum infection is very closely tied to the hygiene conditions, especially of the midwife or doctor. And the fact that she was able somehow to, to, you know, practice the basic hygiene needed to prevent those is astounding. And the doctor said not even the best German hospitals have those numbers. And Mm -hmm. she said in her report that she could see the hatred in his eyes of like, how are you doing this? How are you protecting this life in the middle of this place that is not supposed to be doing that? And yet here it was. It was an extraordinary thing, what she was able to do and and what, (laughs) Rachel, what you said, God's angels around her and protecting her and, and allowing her to be able to do this work. And she also is a, just a gracious person about other the other people who were there with her as well. Uh, when she was first attending all these women, she was on her own. But a few other Polish women doctors came to help her. In her report, she speaks so highly of these women who had no other motivation than to care for humans. 
And I want to read a little part of, of her report because it's, it's beautiful. I won't write about the work of the doctors who were held at Auschwitz as prisoners because what I observed surpasses my ability to say what I really feel about the tremendous dignity of the physician's vocation and the heroism with which they carried out their duties. The magnificence of these doctors and their dedication was the last thing their poor, agonized patients looked upon, but will never be able to say what they saw. These doctors fought to save lives that were doomed, and for these doomed lives gave their own. All they had to treat their patients was a handful of aspirins and their own great hearts. They were not working for the sake of grand reputation or banishment, nor to satisfy their professional ambition. All these incentives had vanished. What was left was just the physician's duty to save lives in all cases and any circumstances she or he happened to encounter augmented by the need to show sympathy for their neighbor. And that's what she lived by. This wasn't for the honor. This was just uh, out of out of love yeah. for neighbor, even in the midst of horrible conditions. The woman in the barracks named her mother because of her love and her care for these women. They could all trust her, which was a hugely rare thing in a Nazi death camp. So in early 1945, most Auschwitz prisoners were forced to leave camp on a death march because of the impending liberation by the Soviet army. But Sanislava refused to leave, and she stayed with her women in the camp until liberation. The last baby she delivered was in a burning barrack because the Germans had set it on fire to hide the things that they had been doing. But she delivered that baby anyway. Heck yeah. Stanislava left camp in February 1945 and returned to Wuch to work as a midwife, of course. This is her calling. <laughs> she prayed over every baby she delivered, remembering her time in Auschwitz. She only really began to talk about her time there in 1957 after she retired. And she does have a report. I'll try to link that too. There's a, a report that she wrote about her time there and all the conditions that she went through. In 1970, there was an official celebration in Warsaw where she met survivors and their children who had been born in the camp. And they, they are so gratefully and deeply, rightfully thankful for her and for her care that they were able to save these, or, or at least try to save these children from the hands of, of these evil people. On March 11th, 1974, Stanislava died of intestinal cancer. She's since been nominated for sainthood in the Catholic Church. Her legacy lives on in the lives of the children she delivered at Auschwitz and her own four children, all of whom survived the war, <gasps> which is amazing. Whoa! I and was going to ask, what happened to Sylvia? <laughs> yeah, all four of her kids survived. They all came back oh. and they all became doctors themselves, too. Yes! So. There is a long line of descendants from Stanislava of people who are wonderful, wonderful, gracious people looking out for the lives of others. So that is Stanislava's story. Hmm. <sighs> you know what? Obviously, when I think of the Holocaust, like nothing, like nothing good comes out of it. Like I can't think of anything <laughs> good that comes out of the event other than Let's not do this again, everybody. Um, <laughs> yeah, never, bit, ever, ever again. Right, but there was a bitter sweetness to this story. Like I, there was, there was hope there, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and just like gladness that even despite the setting and the conditions, like she did the job that she was called to do, and it didn't matter if it was fruitless. It didn't matter who it was. Like she. She just did her job and she did it willingly and presumably with with gladness because, I mean, I don't think that I could be in her situation as a midwife in those conditions. Yeah. So I visited Auschwitz last, mm. last I guess it was in December 2019, last winter. Yeah. And it, it was one of those, I don't know, dreadfully potent sort of experiences mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. and we did a tour and our tour guide told us various stories and there was there was another story about a, a different case where somebody in this case it was a, a priest had offered up to exchange his life for another prisoner that had been condemned mm -hmm. and it was again one of these stories of like hope in the middle of it and somehow even though it was this 
this story of hope and it was beautiful, it also made the contrast like that much sharper so mm-hmm. that like everything else became that much more horror horror filled as you were watching it and learning it. And so that was something that I, I've I've thought about since then as we I don't know, I think there there is sometimes a a tendency for some people, I know I have I I have this tendency of a reluctance to engage with and listen to the really dark stuff. Mm-hmm. And sometimes that's good. And, you know, if it's just your, your fictional entertainment and that sort of thing, and you're not enjoying it, okay. But something that I was, I was thinking about and I was struck by over this last year with some of the different things in the news that would come out, and I was thinking about what St. Paul writes in Philippians when he, he was talking about, it's in Philippians 8, finally, brothers, whatever's true, whatever's honorable, whatever is just, pure, lovely, excellent, commendable, think about these things. And like, I have a tendency maybe to sometimes I'm like, ugh, I don't, I want to focus on the good and the beautiful. But he also says whatever's true. And, Mm -hmm. and so I think it is actually a good, it is a good thing for us to, to dig into some of the truly awful stuff because it's true and to, to bear it witness, even though it's ugly and awful. And there are these bright things that these bright threads that run through many of those stories because, because God is faithful, even in the darkest times. And he does, he preserves people and he, Mm -hmm. he brings in those things, but even without them, it's still, it still is a good thing when it comes to you to see it and acknowledge it and not turn away from it because Mm -hmm. it is ugly and awful. Amen. That's some of what I think about these sort of stories. And and I I think of these things as being so far removed. I'm with you. I hate horror movies. Mm -hmm. I don't willingly, you know, subject myself to this, but you're right. When something happened, you have to acknowledge that and look at it and say, what can we learn from this? I've never been to Auschwitz, but I did have the opportunity a number of years ago to tour Dachau outside Mm -hmm. of Munich. And the thing that struck me about that experience was how unimpressive it was. Mm. It looked normal. Just, Mm -hmm. you know, a few long, low buildings surrounded by a fence with some gravel yards. And you look at it and you go, huh, I would have expected there would be like pits of fire here. You know, something to to indicate that this that that hell touched earth at this place, but there wasn't. And I think that's a lesson for us with the Holocaust. You know, Stanislava was doing her job, but she was also in every day trying to make the right decision to please God, to love people, to entrust her soul no matter what to the God who saves. What were the the German nurses, Schwester Fannig? You know, she was also doing her job, but she was leaving out some of those other steps, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and so it's just, we, we think that, oh, well, Nazis, no problem. We won't do that again. They were disgusting and vile and evil. And, but at the time, it was just normal people doing their jobs, a lot of them. And so I think we need to be very careful and very humble when we approach stories like this and realize that you can step your toe into this kind of, you know, awful maelstrom of hatred Mm -hmm. and find yourself drowning in it without a whole lot of extra steps along the way. And it, it causes me to feel very humble and very small and very scared, honestly. Mm-hmm. that how easy it is for a society to slip into that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Something that I do whenever I, I read books from this time period, World War II era stuff, I always find pictures from these concentration camps or or Google the, the locations that are in my book to, to get the visual. And you're right. It just, it's just, it looks so normal. And then I look through the the pictures of of the the prisoners at these concentration camps, 
and and imagine these people as like my next door neighbor. Like these are mm-hmm. these are all people, somebody's mother and and daughter and brother and son and and I think I like consuming this media because it reminds me of the evil that is possible that we do need to be aware of, but also that it is also possible to fight against these things and Mm -hmm. to stand up for people and you know standing up for your neighbor doesn't have to be a huge thing like standing up to a nazi soldier in the street or something it is as simple as caring for each other and showing love to the people that are closest to you and that's what a lot of these people did during this time and it made a huge difference in the lives of Mm -hmm. of a lot of people (sighs) that is our story for today what a A wonderful wonderful woman woman. like i can't wait to learn more about her like she's the best (laughs) she's fantastic fantastic so there is there there are some resources online there is a documentary available about her that i haven't Ooh. been able to find an actual link to because it's in polish it was, actually, <laughs> it was done it was it was just created i think last year a lot of these resources have just come out last year because of the 75th anniversary of auschwitz so a lot of this stuff has happened just in the last six to 12 months there is a documentary out there i'm trying to figure out how to actually find it because i want to watch it there's an hour-long lecture on her on youtube there's a history.com article there's a couple of other news articles about her and her own testimony so i'll try to find compile all of those resources into one place if you want to learn a little bit more about her I want to also give a shout out to a related resource, a book that I had the honor and privilege to work on a few years back when I was in publishing. This is a young adult graphic novel, age 14 and up, unless your kids are really mature for their age. It's called The War Within These Walls. It's by Aline Sachs, illustrated by Carl Schrizlecki, and was actually translated uh, either from German or Polish. So it was written in Europe and then brought over here. But it looks at life in the Warsaw ghetto and that Warsaw uprising that mm-hmm. Stanislava's husband was was killed in. Mm-hmm. So if you're you know interested in a, a easy to digest take on that, very good book. Intense, like all mm-hmm. these stories are. Yes, but but well worth it. Well, ladies, uh, we'd love to hear your thoughts about this, or maybe you have your own books and resources that you like to read every year during Holocaust Remembrance. Share them with us in our Facebook group. You can join us in the Lutheran Ladies Lounge on Facebook. You can find all of our podcasts at kfuo.org slash Lutheran Ladies Lounge or on your favorite podcasting app. You're listening to the Lutheran Ladies Lounge podcast. I'm Sarah. I'm Erin. I'm Bree. And I'm Rachel. Views and opinions expressed on the Lutheran Ladies' Lounge podcast may not represent the official position of the management or ownership of KFUO Radio, the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod. The Lutheran Ladies' Lounge is produced by KFUO Radio and available at kfuo.org or wherever you get your podcasts. Join our community on Facebook in the Lutheran Ladies' Lounge.